the Omicron variant has kind of dominated the headlines here in Louisiana. We have kind of developed a little tradition amongst uh, since COVID began of being out in front of all the surges. We had Delta before everybody. We had the first surge before everybody. Omicron looking like it's not going to be any different as we're seeing a record number of cases and then a record number of cases and then the next day a record number of cases. Uh, 12,000 on Thursday, which they didn't count on Friday because of the holiday. So what do we know about the Omicron variant? Well, joining us now to talk about that is Patty Olinger. She's the executive director of the Global Biorisk Advisory Council, which is such an ominous name. Patty, good morning. Welcome to Talk 107.3. How are you? Oh, good morning. Thank you for having me. No, glad to have you on here. Um, let's start off with what we know. This thing started in South Africa. What have we been able to learn about the Omicron variant? Uh, well, from a scientific standpoint, they've learned that there are several different uh, mutations on this particular variant. And that was what concerned um, folks in the very beginning, wondering how, if it was going to be able to evade our vaccines, if it was going to be more virulent, um, and what the, the, you know, the impact on us as individuals was going to have. What we found is that it spreads very easily. And we're seeing that right now with the positive cases that are just exploding, it seems like, all over the place. And But that the case that you actually, the, the illness that you have doesn't seem to be as, you know, um, you know as serious as, say, the Delta variant. Mm -hmm. So if you've got several mutations on the same variant, how, what's the determination between mutations of a variant and just different variants altogether? Uh, you know, that, that's, that's a great question. You know, what they look at is, okay, if they have the, the, the parent comp, the parent compound, the parent virus, mm -hmm. and they look at, is there a change? Once you start having changes, you will have a, a variant say, and if it's, we'll call it viable, if it can be transmissible, then it becomes more of interest. And that's where Delta was a very serious variant because it also caused, you know, very serious illness compared to the parent. And then this this particular um, variant, the Omicron, has, I think it's up to a little over 50 um, mutations from that very beginning um, parent, uh, that virus. Wow. I, it just with so many mutations, does that make it harder to learn from it? Um, you know, they have to rethink again. They have yeah. to take it back into the, the labs. They have to do the research on it. You know, the concern, and this is something that I've heard, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, it's not that serious. Why don't we just, you know, um, you know, herd immunity? You know, if you get sick, you'll it'll be like a bad cold. The problem with that philosophy is that if you allow these variants to continue to circulate, they will mutate again. Right. And the fear is, is that at some point in time, one will be even more serious than say the Delta variant. Do we have comps? Like, do we, are we able to make historical comparisons to how variants spring off of and mutations spring off of, and we get new surges that they get stronger rather than weaker as they move around? Um, some of our flu, um, you know, obviously the 1918 was extremely serious. But if you look at some of our flu his history, um, that's something that they're, they're always have been concerned. And if, in fact, you know, two two years ago, if you would have asked scientists what was going to be the next pandemic. They would have said probably the flu. And so when we when we start looking in comparison yes you know as, as things change a lot of times they just kind of fizzle out but there's always that fear that something because it's a biological you know mutation right. that they could become more serious yeah it just there's there's a feeling early on like it feels like this is more diluted more you know it just it, it's not going to have the same effects and the number of cases and here in Louisiana especially the number of cases we're seeing rolling in on a daily basis is just so overwhelming compared to uh, the, well, the number of hospitalizations is not keeping up on the same level as the Delta variant was. Uh, is I would assume that means that our sense of urgency as a populace will drop as well, and that's where the danger comes in, if I'm hearing you right. Yeah, and I think we're seeing that already. I mean, if you think about it, um, you know, we, we're tired. Everybody's tired. You know, that pandemic fatigue is definitely setting in. Um, people don't want to wear masks. They don't have to anymore. They, they, you know, think about in the very beginning how well we were all 
you know, carrying hand sanitizer and washing our hands and paying close attention to surfaces. And even though this is an airborne pathogen, you know, when you go, let's say, to a, a, a situation where there's a lot of people and somebody, um, you know, coughs in their hand and they touch a surface and then you immediately go right past that, those high touch points are really important to pay attention to because those are the, that's that very common thing that can transfer it from a surface. Um, the indoor air, I think if there's a silver lining mm-hmm. um, to this virus and the new technologies that are coming out, we'll have better indoor air, not only for COVID, but just allergens and everything in, in, in general. But um, we have a lot to learn and we have a lot to continue to do go forward with in this next, I would say, four to six months. Yeah, and that's that seems to be the uh, the pattern for for the different variants and different waves, like it was with Delta, uh, about four months before you know it, it 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 peaks, crests, whatever, and then starts to wane a little bit. Uh, now this variant started in South Africa. Um, have we learned a lot from the South South African population and how they dealt with it? And is it is it fair? Is it safe to make those comparisons to our population in the U.S.? Um, yes and no. Uh, yeah, we've learned a lot. I mean, all in, in any of the other countries that are, are looking at Omicron, which is pretty much in almost all the countries now, we're learning from each other. You know, the scientists in those, those countries are, are sharing information about this variant. Um, it's hard to sometimes, you know, look at, you know, our experience versus somebody else's experience from country to country whether it's the United States or Australia or South Africa or the UK, because we do have different, I would say, you know, uh, cultural um, issues. Sometimes it's easier for a country to say you can't do this or you can um, and control things, Um, you know, but at the bottom, it all comes down to, a part of it comes down to human behavior, how we are going to, as individuals, look at things and, and, and respond yeah, the the controlling human behavior has been a, a a hot button for a lot of folks, especially now that this will be the fifth wave. Uh, the Omicron variant will generally just be the fifth wave of COVID throughout. And, and I guess the question is, if the same playbook doesn't stop the next wave from coming, why don't we see new playbooks adapted? Um, you know, I, I totally understand what you're saying and agree with you. And I think that that's one of the things that there has been so much different information that comes out that I think a lot of people are, are wondering who to believe, what to believe, and what really is happening here. Um, we know that masks work, but we also know that, you know, just one piece of, you know, cotton cloth probably isn't going to protect you or and others like it, like we would like it to. And so yeah. masks do work, something better than nothing, but the quality needs to be looked at as well we know that vaccines work but there are people that don't want to get a vaccine um, for multiple reasons Um, we know that surfaces matter but you know i think that the the mantra that had come out for a long time was oh it's air it's air it's air and everybody wanted everybody to focus on wearing masks getting vaccinated in air that they kind of ignored the the surface transmission issue Um, and so the messages that people are hearing are conflicting and so they don't know what playbook to look at. And that's what we've been working with at GVAC is to work with facilities and service providers as far as do a risk assessment, understand the virus, and put in place, be in compliance wherever you need to be, but let's put in place, you know, work practices and, and things that will influence behavior so that we can get through this um, pandemic. Got about one minute left with uh, Patty Olinger, uh, the executive director of the Global Biorisk Advisory Council. Want to ask you about that because the the contact transfer, the you know surface transfer or whatever, uh, that kind of got downplayed a lot along the way, but it's still a part of the overall equation. When when the virus lands on a surface, can it be kicked back up in the air from there? Yes, um, depends on the on how clean the surface is. Let's say it was really dusty, and you know, as you're as you're going to clean the surface, and you're you're disturbing that that can. The other part of that is, you know, really for businesses, high touch points, and paying attention to whatever it is, cleaner disinfectant that you're using, and reading that label. I I can't tell you how many times I've seen people just what we would call spray and wipe. 
right. where they're not really allowing for that dwell time. And some of these new, not necessarily new, but the new formulations that are coming out that are EPA approved have dwell times of 30 seconds and leave no residual. Right. And so they're really interesting um, chemistries that are coming out that are safer and for both people and environment and also sanitize, clean, and disinfect. And so those are really important. But, yes, those surfaces are, are to me, one of the things that probably have not been paid attention to like they should. Got one minute left, uh, Patty uh, Olinger from the uh, Global Bio-Risk Advisory Council. Last thing before I get you out of here, I know we can't, we can't call it a trend yet because the Omicron variant is appearing milder than the last one. But when the next variant comes out and the next variant will come out, if that one appears milder than this one and this one is milder than the last one, can we then start to see a light at the end of the tunnel? I believe so. I think we're going to see that um, because we're going to get better treatments. We're going to get um, a better understanding of how the vaccines really work as time goes on. It wouldn't surprise me if this is like the flu, um, that it becomes part of our normal, you know, vaccine, say, regimen. Um, and that as, as, as we evolve with this work, the new norm is going to be a little different than it was in the past. And, yeah. you know, um, it is just something that is the reality. And I think that's one of the things that we just need to embrace that and say, what do we need to do to keep open? What do we need to do to be safe and, and be healthy going forward? She is Patty Olinger, the executive director of the Global Bio-Risk Advisory Council. Thank you so much for hopping on board this morning. Great information. Thank you for having me, and you guys have a happy new year, and let's stay, stay safe together. You do the same.